Hello everyone and welcome to the Jack and Joe show and for the first time ever we're not only saying hello to everyone on YouTube but we're also saying hello to those listening to us on the Fulhamish podcast so hello everyone uh, Jack and I do this show weekly we wanted to give you a bit of a glimpse into the kind of content that we have available on YouTube and we'd be thrilled if you would join us there in the future Jack how are you doing? Yep we're coming through loud and clear on the new mics thanks very much and yeah doing really well how are you doing? Yeah, very good. Very excited. Um, it's very strange to be um, possibly listening to this back on, you know, one of Spotify or something like that and just hearing us rather than seeing us. But very excited. We haven't spoken since the Peterborough game on air. Um, for those of you that are listening for the first time, we normally do a video on a Monday when we can um, following the weekend's game, previewing the midweek one. And then sometimes we also review that on perhaps a Thursday before the weekend and mm. sometimes even treat ourselves to a live stream like on deadline day but this week um, we've only got one game to review because it's the international break um, and it's already been covered on a lot of platforms so I think we can breeze over it slightly but Jack you were there looked like mm. you had a great day what was it like? Um, in all honesty it was a bit bizarre it felt as if um, it felt as if the whole game felt like two different games and and this was from a supporter's perspective when you were standing or sitting in the away end it generally felt like in the second half as opposed to the first we'd swapped ends but not the players the supporters and I don't know maybe it was just me maybe I was just a bit out of it but it felt a bit bizarre and um, it was a frustrating afternoon one where you know you come off a 7-0 win you think right we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna roll through these um it just doesn't happen like that. The fatigue kicks in um, quite early. I mean, we played six. This is our sixth game. It's our final game before the international break. And there was tiredness at the end of the game. Mitrovic basically hauled himself to the ground uh, late on to basically indicate that he was so tired he couldn't play on or could hardly play on it. I think he subsequently got substituted. And, and then Tim Ream, of course, tweeting after the game saying he was absolutely knackered as well. Look, it was one of those games, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Brighton and Hove Albion, 16, 17. You love this comparison. <laughs> well, it's just the way in which they, they got promoted, and I'm seeing similarities in this Marco Silva team. It's winning games. Yes, we've been impressive at times, but it's winning games without being impressive and generally just being the better team with the better quality and just having that moment of quality. And that's what I saw on Saturday. Seems like a long time ago now. It was eight days ago, and I'm raring to go for the, uh, for the next few games, Joe. Yeah, I mean, there's a wonderful article for those that haven't read it um, on the Fulhamish website about some of our winning runs in recent years. Six games, I believe, uh, I haven't written this down, is our longest since the Tagana days, um, which were before my time watching Fulham um, because I was about you know one foot three um, and just not really aware of what was going on. Um, so this winning run really shouldn't be glossed over. I think it's something we need to talk about. Um, and I think something that you said there, which is very true, is that it was a different kind of win, completely different to the Blackburn game, very much maybe an after the Lord Mayor's show sort of performance when you knew we were going to be sort of taken back down to, to earth from cloud nine, which mm. we were on at Ewood Park. Um, I feel like over this six game run and six games that we've won, um, we've seen all kinds of wins. We've played teams like Peterborough that have really stopped us playing the way we wanted to. We've demolished some teams like Blackburn. Um, we've had games where they've been quite even, but the quality is told, such as Nottingham Forest. Mm. And we've had the sort of games like Cardiff, I would say, where we normally struggle. We normally can't break these team down, teams down in past years, especially in the championship. We've basically seen that we can overcome any test. And what are the main things that you think have changed since that Coventry game because that was the last international break. We're in the next one now. It's the last one till next year. Um, we need to hope that we get another reaction like that. But what do you think's changed since that Coventry game? Because to me, it seems like everything has changed. We feel like a different a different side. Mm. The, the Coventry game was a huge indication of where this Fulham team was in terms of their mentality. And what I saw against Peter uh, against Coventry, sorry, was. Um, a performance in the first half where we weren't on top and we'd managed to take the lead. Of what, We've seen that sort of thing before this season as well, especially against Peterborough, where we 
we arguably weren't on top and we still came away with the victory. But in this case, we were one nil up at half time and everyone was in the concourse thinking, yeah, we haven't been at our best, but if we kick on, we'll probably get the three points. And it just didn't happen. And basically what happened there was Joshua Onomar giving the ball away with, with like Mawson or Tim Ream or something. And, and, and that was the reason in which they scored their equaliser. And since then, we haven't seen Josh Onomar play. I don't know whether that has got anything to do with what happened on the pitch in that second half. But um, basically, there's a lot of factors that came into that game. We didn't have Tosin, we didn't have Seri, or we didn't have from the start. And then when they came in for those for the next six games, they've obviously been a huge um, reason as to why our performances have picked up and why we picked up so many points. They've been immense. But no, Coventry was a complete meltdown. In performances, it was the way in which we conceded the equaliser, and then moments later, albeit it was a foul, uh, sorry, albeit it was a dive, we conceded and made it two one. Uh, they made it two one, and then we just couldn't recover. And the conditions weren't easy; it was drilling it down with rain. And look, you see, you sometimes see this where the team from the Premier League comes down and they get a battering from a team like Coventry who are on this massive high. So let me answer your question, in saying what has changed. I think there's just been a little bit of more of a. Let's remember what we stand for and who we are and what sort of football we play. And we sort of just kind of stamped our authority on the championship. And look, when you go into an international break off the back of losing 4-1 to Coventry, knowing you've got Queen's Park Rangers coming down to you a couple of weeks later who were, on, who were at the time on good form, and then you get pegged back after going a goal up. Again, the jitters and, and the nerves that were going around Craven Cottage was was something I haven't seen all season because people are getting nervous about what had happened two weeks ago. And that is where the quality shown. And you have to say that the next six games has just been down to the quality we've shown. And that's not just Alexander Mitrovic scoring all those goals. That's the delivery of ball from Nice and Scabano. That's the uh, the nous in midfield of John Mikel Seri, the, the return of Tom Kearney, the stillness at the back from Tim Ream and Tosin Adarabayo. These are all factoring into why we've played so well over the last six games. And now I'm seeing a completely different Fulham side to what we saw against Coventry at the Rico Arena. I think you're completely right. And what I've also noticed is the fact that if you look at the Tosin suspension as an example, um, Michael Hector coming in, playing two mm -hmm. games, not conceding a goal. Yes, maybe not the highest calibre of opposition. I mean, in one of the games, you know, they had 10 men for the best part of 60 plus minutes. But it didn't make a difference to how the team played. And I think that's one difference to the Coventry game where um, I think it would be fair to say that Mawson came in. Onoma came in, as you said before, and it almost felt as if the team was completely different. It felt like it wasn't the same Fulham out there. It felt like a Fulham that was vulnerable. It felt like a Fulham that wasn't confident, not an aspiring Premier League team. Now, one player change and a key player at that in Tosin, it felt the same. It feels like there's a mentality change that's happened for the entire squad and the standards have been raised, which I love to see. Um, this run of six wins has left us six points ahead of West mm. Brom in third. If you factor in goal difference, um, then that's basically a seven-point gap. So it's a huge gap at this stage of the season. Nothing is done. What I wanted to ask you, Jack, your opinion of is this race for top two, where currently you have Bournemouth and ourselves sitting in the top two, you've then got West Brom, you've got the likes of Stoke and Coventry, Luton even doing very well. Mm. Um, who do you see as our main competition for getting in the top two I don't want to talk about winning the league I want to talk about top two so you've obviously got Bournemouth who look very strong you have to say you've got West Brom but for me West Brom don't look convincing at all so I wondered who do you see as the main con competition other than Bournemouth if you even see Bournemouth as competition but I think you do look, look Bournemouth are a team who have frustrated me all season because they've had a low xg and um well up until like a couple of games ago they were like something like midway through the table in xg like 12 or 13 or something and still churning out results and they were still unbeaten up until that game against Preston but let's put Bournemouth to one side you have to look at West Brom because you kind of put at the beginning of the season we put um, the championship into some categories and the, the front runners were ourselves Bournemouth West Brom and Sheffield United and of course Sheffield United have had a, a poor start and I don't see them doing anything apart from a late push for the playoffs. But you have to look at West Brom because you say they're not playing well. And they haven't. They lost to us. They lost to Stoke. And they look poor on both occasions. But they're still churning out results. They're still getting results. Despite not playing very well against Birmingham, they won. Um, the other day, they beat 
Middlesbrough. No, they drew with Middlesbrough 1-1. Beat Hull. Um, yeah. Beat Hull as well 1-0. So these tiny little wins and small margins they're getting from these games. And then they trounce Bristol City 3-0 with Jordan Hugo scoring a brace as well. You can't underestimate them. They'll probably give us a very tough game when we go to the Hawthorns. But but if you want to make things interesting and look outside of those those four or three teams, as, as I as I put it, um, I, I can't look past Middlesbrough now with Chris Wilder. Yeah. Chris Wilder's come in and Middlesbrough are sort of on a little bit of a bounce at, before the managers come in, which is really odd. Um, obviously, they drew the game with, with West Brom. But I think they were quite good value and they probably should have won it in the last minute, if not for a great save from Sam Johnston. Great save, yeah. Uh, and they were already looking to bring back Jed Spence from Nottingham Forest. They're already trying to make their plans. They've already got a couple of players who can... Uh, the Argentinian centre mid, I think the name has escaped me for now. But um, Piero? He's, he's, Piero, yeah. He's yeah. he's pro- proven to be a bit of a problem. He's, he's coming in with goals and assists. And Middlesbrough... They might not have the best team on paper, but you know what Chris Wilder is like. He'll get a style of play. He'll get them playing. And this is not a threat for top two as such, but it's someone who I see as being a potential problem down the line. Uh, but but I have to I have to say West Brom like right now because, you know, yes, we're six points ahead of them. But let's say we lose to Bournemouth in a couple of weeks' time and they pick up a couple of wins. That's going to get narrower, more narrow. And... Uh, Stoke and Coventry, I suppose. I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm rambling a little bit here, but I don't see Coventry maintaining this playoff push right now. I see Swansea. Swansea are another team. I I fear. What about you? Swansea are giving me serious Fulham under Jukanovic vibes. Slow start players that probably aren't good enough to play the passing out the back game being replaced by some that are better or being trained to be better. They made some good signings, but um, the players that they've had have improved under Russell Martin's management. I I feel like they are a dark horse for the playoffs. Maybe not even a dark horse anymore. They're not far off. Um, There's another few that we haven't mentioned, like Luton, um, who I've been impressed with. Former Fulham guy, Adebayo up front, doing quite well. Um, But I agree. I don't see any of these teams, and I hope this doesn't, age terribly i don't see any of these sides as um competition for automatic places i see them as part of a very very competitive race for the top six um i think this season um parachute payments and such has heightened the gap between the teams at the top and the teams that are going for the playoffs and i would be surprised if the gap between ourselves bournemouth west brom etc doesn't widen from those in the playoffs very soon i feel like there's a golf in quality there um, that cannot be underestimated. Um, and don't get me wrong, having the best one in the league does not guarantee you anything. You have to perform well. It's an unpredictable league. We saw that against Coventry. Um, I feel like that was the wake-up call we needed. It, it doesn't guarantee anything, and this league doesn't owe you anything. But I do feel like there is a big, big quality gap. And at the moment, I agree with you that it's three fitting into two places with Bournemouth, ourselves, and West Brom, I've been surprised by how poor Sheffield United have been so far. I wouldn't write them off the playoffs because we know what Jukanovic is um, mm. <laughs> second half mm. of the season are like. They are unbelievable. Um, but I think I agree with you. I, I've not been impressed with West Brom. And I think we said this when we reviewed our 3-0 win over them a few weeks ago that I think they could be doing so much better if they played football rather than really aggressive, direct play. Because there's no right or wrong way to play football, but I feel like the players they've got would be good enough. I feel like they've got a very good squad. Um, I'd possibly say second best in the league behind us. Um, I feel like Bournemouth's is around the same, um, but I feel like West Brom's might edge it. You know, they've got some quality players in there. Johnston in goal, Grant up front, Robinson. You know, Livermore's very experienced, maybe not. The best now, but Snodgrass as well. Malumbi did great against us. Furlong's got to be one of the best fullbacks in the league when he's not um, taking out Harry Wilson going down on goal. Um, <laughs> it's a weird one. I feel like they'd be doing so much better, but alas, here we are. Um, and I hope we can extend this gap. Because like you say, you know, one week swings it and it's three-point gap and suddenly, oh my goodness, they're breathing down our necks again and nothing is done. We've got so many games left to play. But the signs are really really good so far so um our next opponent then as we said earlier is barnsley 
at the weekend. Currently don't have a manager. There's a few names floating about, um, but nothing in place yet. I remember the last time we played Barnsley. Yes. Mm. Um, that was not, not fun. Uh, no. Corley Woodrow had a field day. So what are you expecting from this one? I think the people who are going to make comparisons to that game are fair to, but also we were had a completely different team, a completely different manager, a completely different playing style and idea. And Barnsley right now, given that they lost to Hull last time out 2-0, you do fear for them, especially they've sacked shop now. They haven't got the manager in. Um, reports are suggesting, and I can't remember the name of the manager in which they were linked to, that they might get someone in before our game with them. But nevertheless, I think this is all about how we play and, and how we react to the international break. Um, I was wary going into the QPR game, given what we'd done at Blackpool. Alas, we we did very well and we won the game. Uh, and I'm not too concerned now coming in. I mean, Niskan Scabano didn't even play today in their second game for DR Congo. Massive game for Mitrovic tonight, which we'll be watching later. Cristiano yeah. Ronaldo versus Alexander Mitrovic. Um but but let's let's answer the question in hand. What would you expect from this Barnsley team? I expect ten men behind the ball, take a point and yeah. run. Um, and it's just whether Fulham can break them down, whether we can um, use the set pieces because that that's actually something we could talk about now. Using yeah. our set pieces to our advantage because we've scored so many goals from those set pieces. Um, the the blocking style, the uh, the NBA sort of style or NF, uh, NBA style, yes, um, from um, that that fantastic article in the Athletic um, uh, from Peter Rutzler. Um, and, and it could be, again, one of those days where, yes, I think because we're at home, we'll have the lion's share of possession and the chances, but it could be a frustrating afternoon and Fulham fans have got to stay patient and stick with us. But like we've done this season, we've scored a lot of early goals. And I think if we get one early goal and they have to push out and try and attack us, that could get quite tasty for Fulham. And I, I think you'd be a brave man to back draw or Barnsley on Saturday, but I'm sure there'll be someone who does it and there'll be a big price. Yeah, I think you're right with what you say about the early goal. Um, it links slightly to a stat that I read from um, one of the guests we had on earlier this season, Benjamin Bloom. Mm. He's a wonderful content creator for those that don't know him. Um, and he was saying that when we've scored twice this season, no one's been able to stop us. We've won every single game. Mm. Um, and the only time that we've scored less than that and won is now Peterborough. So it was a real sort of mentality change, grinding it out. Mm. Other occasions we've scored one or less every time we've dropped points. Um, obviously, only failed to score once against um, Blackpool, but Coventry got one, Middlesbrough, Bristol City, Reading also got one in all of those. Um, it's a weird thing to say, but I feel like you're completely right that if we get an early goal, I don't think there's many teams or any teams in this league that can stop us because once a team attacks us, and I think we really saw that with um, the Swansea game stuck out for me, the amount of space that was on the break, I fancy us to get at least one more goal. Um, I think that we're very, very good at counter-attacking and I don't fancy many teams to score two against us the way we're defending at the moment. So um, I think you're completely right. An early goal changes everything. We saw with the Peterborough game what can happen if we don't get one. It gets a bit difficult. It, there's no there's no real space. We're relying on a wonderful cross from Cabano and somehow Mitrovic finding a bit of space in that box and a great guided header into the bottom corner. But we're not always going to get those moments of magic. Um, it's going to be a tough game. I agree. Corley Woodrow, um, I'm sure, will play very well for them again. I believe he's their captain. Um, and, mm. you know, there's no tough, there's no easy game in this league. But the fact is, we've got three games coming up. We've got Barnsley at home, Derby at home, Preston away. I would say, and obviously it's not the end of the world if this doesn't happen, but for let alone top two, I would say if if our aspirations are winning the league, this will hopefully be another nine point week because yeah. Preston will be a tough test. But these games individually, I think, are very winnable. And I would really hope that we can capitalise on this because Bournemouth have got a very tough week coming up. Mm. If we were to win this game, we would temporarily go top of the league. Which they would, yes, because they play unnoticed. Sunday, don't they? Because they mm. get their, their games on Sunday, then they play Millwall midweek, which is another tough game. Ooh. I believe then they have Coventry, which is the last game before the big one in early December against us. So it's a really tough run. Um, <laughs> Huge game. 
I'm delighted that Matt Wells will be joining us back at Craven Cottage, I've got to say. Um, and Rob Birch, goalkeeper coach. Can't forget about him. Yeah. Um, oh, and Alistair Harris. Um, well, what, what, what's, big about the, <laughs> what's big about the game against Bournemouth is, um, I mean, every Fulham fan will want to continue this winning run, but if we were to get three from the next three, we could make it 10 wins from 10 against Bournemouth. I know I'm getting well ahead of myself here, yeah. but let's just say... <laughs> And that would be great to get that, you know, that big milestone over um, over Scott Parker. And of course, I think there will be a lot of needle and I'm sure we'll talk about it closer to the time. But that Bournemouth game really is on the horizon quick and it's going to be a big one on that Friday night game on Sky Sports, Joe. Yeah, huge. Can't, can't wait for it. But I, th- I think my point is no easy game, no disrespect to any opposition. And this will be a tough one. And I'd be delighted if we won against Barnsley. Mm. You have to look at each game individually and just get over the line. But this is a winnable game. and. I really want to win it, especially because of what happened last time, home and mm. away. We were poor both times, didn't show up. Team with lesser quality beat us fair and square both times because they wanted it more. Um, I haven't seen that with Fulham this season other than the Coventry game, I would say. Um, and it looks like we've really kicked on since then. It looks like we wanted it more than every opposition. Um, prime example, Marek Rodax, unbelievable save from Johnson Clark Harris, the mm. very end of the Peterborough game. Harrison Reed is first the loose ball. He absolutely busted a gut to get there and clear it. Body on the line. And it's just stuff I love to see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, tough game. How, how would you line up for it? I mean, I, I can barely remember the team that lined up against Peterborough. It feels like so long okay. ago. Who would you go with as your 11? Well, let's remember that Tosin's still out for another game. Yes. So that's um, that's probably going to be uh, Rodak. I would start Tete. I think Adoy is suspended for this game. Yes, he is. He picked up his fifth booking. Great. So um, in comes Kenny Tete. Um, Hector, Reem, left back, Robinson. Um, and then we've got, I would play John Mikel Seri alongside Harrison Reed. Harry Wilson on the right. Cabano left. Bobby D. Cordova Reed. Uh, just behind Alexander Mitrovic. I, I don't think I'd change it. I mean, you could say Kenny comes into this team, but um, again, has he got that much match sharpness? He came on and kind of changed the game when he came on against Peterborough. Um, but starting him means we have to drop maybe one of, um, we well, have to stop, drop either Bobby Deacon over Reed, um, Harrison Reed, or John Mikel Surrey. And none of those three, and we've talked about this before, no, no, none of the players deserved, deserve to be dropped right now. Uh, and that's and our strength in depth is just so good that if they do get dropped, we've got someone to replace them. I mean, Carvalho could start. You just never know. Yeah. We haven't really covered that whole thing on 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 this side of things, on the YouTube side of things. But um, I guess, what would you do? What would you do? I, I think I'd go with the same. I'm just forgetting the name. Sorry, who are you playing in the number ten position? Just to check, Bobby with a new mic, D Cordova Reed. <laughs> oh, I thought so. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think I'd go with the same. Tete's got to come in. He's the logical yeah. choice. Um, and he's a better player. He's a better right back. And always done well. Had a mare against uh, future Fulham signing Sariki Dembele um, <laughs> in the first half. Like just got um, yeah. taken for a spin in a new car. Awful. <laughs> but um, yeah, Tete in. I wouldn't change anything else. I agree that Kearney could start, but my opinion is don't change a winning team. I know that the team that finished the game would have Kearney in mm. um, instead of Seri, but I don't think you can drop Seri in my personal no. opinion. And I don't think Bobby's done anything to be dropped either. Um, so go, go the same team. Let's see what happens. If we are struggling, we have Kearney on the bench. We have Carvalho on the bench. We have Moon is on the bench to bring on if we yeah. need another goal, you know. Exactly. Um, need to start quick get an early goal as you say and then we hopefully should be golden but it's so much easier said than done the Peterborough game and I would say that Peterborough defensively are worse than Barnsley um I think the stats stats back that up but I think whenever I've seen them this season they've shipped a few um Barnsley look if it wasn't for Derby's points deduction they would be bottom of the division right now we know they're low on confidence that almost makes me more wary because it's a it's a free hit for them. Everyone that's a neutral is expecting them to come to Craven Cottage, leave with a spanking three nil or something. Um, it's just it's just one of those like banana skin games, and we need to make sure that we assert our dominance and don't turn up expecting to win. We need to earn it. Mm. Um, what do you think will happen then? What, what was your what was your score prediction for that game? It's tough because 
you know, normally we make a score prediction on, on a Wednesday or a Thursday before a game. Yeah. And, you know, we're looking ahead to this weekend and not all the internationals have been finished and stuff. But Oh, yeah, um, touch wood that no one gets injured, yeah, by the way. I'm going to closely watch Alec Mitrovic tonight. Um, of course, Jomi Calceri scored for the Ivory Coast um, yesterday as well. Um, I'm going to say Fulham will win this by two goals to nil. And I know that sounds a bit boring, but I would take boring. Um, and I, like, it's three points. I don't know why anyone else would complain. And I want to keep this clean sheet run going as well. Um, I think we'll get one maybe just before half time, and then get a second on the break, perhaps, or break them down at some point in the second half and get a second. Uh, and then maybe bring on the likes of Kearney, Muniz, Carvalho, um, and rest up. Uh, one thing, a point to be made is the fact that Adoy has got suspended now means I don't think we're going to see him back in the starting 11 for a while because Tete's automatically earned back that place. He is the better right back and everyone will see that he's the better right back. Therefore, when Adoy comes back for Derby, it's surely it's surely just going to be Tete just slots in that right back. I don't know if you agree, but uh, what do you think the score is going to be as well on Saturday? I think I'm going to be boring as well and go 2-0. That's a scoreline I had in my head even before you spoke your words of wisdom. So I think I'm going to go with that. Um, I, I feel like it's the, it's got to be one of those where we try and kill it like the West Brom game. And then we do rotate a bit because, as you say, we've got the Derby game um, four, four days after, I believe, on the Wednesday. Um, Wednesday so night, yeah. that's got to be the priority. Um, in terms of the Tete situation, I, I think you're right. If you listen to um, Tim Ream's interview on the Fulham Fix this week, um, his oh, second course, yeah. unbelievable interview this season, um, <laughs> then um, he basically speaks about Rodak at the start of the season in something that we didn't know in saying that Rodak was injured at the start of the season, which is why Gazaniga started the first game and continued, obviously, until until after the Coventry game. And what we've seen, basically, is you earn your place back. And until someone either, you know, really screws it up or you're performing super well in training, they will not be dropped. Uh, Tete now, I feel like, would have earned his place back anyway with Adoy's first half performance against Peterborough. The suspension Four. adds another level to it and hopefully touch wood again for about the 60th time in this video slash podcast um yeah i can hear it. I, I, the new mic's good jack i can the hear new it. mics are good yeah, yeah it's good. <laughs> um yeah um he hope he doesn't get injured again hope he doesn't drop a clanger we know the quality he's got um and yeah i, I would imagine that he will start for the foreseeable future as long as he can um mm. I'm nervous as I always am, but it's another three game week and a chance to really try and assert our position even more um, in the top two. I realise that I haven't checked who we've said about who Bournemouth are playing. I haven't checked who West Brom are playing. So they've got um, Huddersfield away next Saturday. Ooh, they they lost that last Blackpool, time in the championship. Blackpool away, who is Ooh. another very tough game. They then have Forest at home. And Coventry away, so it's Crikey. a really tough four-game run for them. Reg regardless of the next three games for Bournemouth, if we were to increase that lead over the third place, and we'd really yeah. run away with Bournemouth, suddenly the significance of the game against Bournemouth, albeit, will still be there because of the history between yeah. Parker and Fulham. But it wouldn't, we wouldn't be crying our eyes out if it came out as a one-all draw. It wouldn't be no. that frustrating. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. On, yeah. Uh, just before we close, I do want to pose you the question that you're talking about, Kenny Tete, there. Um, let's hypothetically say that Michael Hector comes in and we keep, we keep three clean sheets. Interesting. Does yeah. that make Tosin vulnerable and not start against Derby? Because I'm on the fence. I'm on the, I'm on the opinion that Tosin's our most in, one of our most important players. He, he plays regardless of, of any other player's form. Same with John Mikel Seri, really. I I agree with you, and I I don't know if this will apply to someone of Tosin's importance to this team. Like, for example, if Mitrovic had a suspension, um, I feel like he would come straight back into the team, even if Moon is scored as his replacement. I feel like some players have to be an exception to this because, mm. realistically, and Hector's done well. Don't get me wrong, Tosin is the better defender, and he's been brilliant this season, and. I feel like he should be in our team if he's available. And, you know, we go up next season, hypothetically, who's going to be the player we turn to? It's going to be Tosin over Hector. Again, with no disrespect to him, he's done very well since coming in, hasn't really made any errors.
but it's interesting because we know that silver doesn't really work that way um he doesn't work that way at all you know rodak's come back in after gaznig had a horrible game and rodak was showing good form in training um tete was fit for ages but didn't come back in for a doy even though we all thought me included oh he's a banker put him straight back in um really interesting and i guess we'll find out against um derby i think the only way that there's even a question on it is if hector has another performance and clean sheet i feel like and this sounds harsh if we don't keep a clean sheet there's no question tosin comes Mm. straight back in no. If we did keep a clean sheet and it's the third in a row with that partnership that did very well in the back end of the 1920 season, then Silver does have a question to answer. But I think the answer is Tosin. Tosin's part of the spine. And yeah. I think that speaks volumes for anything else. Tosin's our most important player in the defensive area. Therefore, he should play every game he's available for. That's no disrespect to Michael Hector, who's been a, a really good servant at the club. Um, for, for whatever contributions he's made, he's always stepped up and he's done, done well. But I would argue that he didn't have a very, very good game against Peterborough. He was slightly erratic in his um, yeah. appearances. Uh, and someone did some really good analysis on Hector um, compared to Tosin in terms of their heading away and their clearances away. Um, also, distribution, can I just say it's night and day. Hector is not very good on the ball whatsoever. And Tosin, mm-hmm. I think, is absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, as a defender, that can only... That only matters so much, but for the way we play, it matters a lot. It's that night and day. <laughs> right. Uh, that will do it for the Jack and Joe show this week. Um, it's been fantastic, not only to be on the YouTube channel yet again, but to be in your podcast is this week with the brand new mics. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Fulhamish for, for hooking us up with those. Uh, they make such a good difference. It feels like you're just, well, it just feels great. It feels just brilliant uh, professional and just really clear and hopefully it's come through very well in your ears as as it has with ours joe any closing remarks before we uh, before we uh, close the curtain no no d- delighted that we've um, been on the podcast this time as well thank you to sammy and everyone for giving us the, the the space to do that and i hope that for anyone listening you will join us on youtube in the future to everyone on youtube thank you as ever for your support we reached four thousand subscribers uh last yes. week which is a huge milestone for us and we're very very grateful on to 5k but four thousand don't get us wrong we realized the size of that you know it, it to, to me it feels amazing um to have that many people actually making the effort to subscribe so greatly appreciate it Last thing I would say is that the votes are still open for the FSA Awards, where we're up for um, Best Fan Media. If you would take the time um, to vote, it just takes two seconds. Uh, you don't have to vote for anyone else, but um, in the other categories, that is. But um, we'd massively appreciate it. We're up against some real big hitters, but it would be amazing if you could spare five seconds to vote. But Jack, it's been an absolute pleasure. And thanks to everyone for watching and listening. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, we'll be back Whenever we'll be back, um, we've got someone lined up to come on, but we're not sure whether we can get him on this week or sometime in the future. If not, you'll see us on Monday after the Barnsley game where we'll be scratching our heads and thinking what went wrong or we'll be (laughs) smiling again, going seven in a row. Uh, Thanks very much for watching. Uh, Please like, subscribe and, uh, and come on Fulham.